What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be checking out Cultist Simulator. Uh, this is one of those games that like, I honestly believe is one of the better games like ever made in the indie genre. But it's a very, very weird game that's not going to sit well with a lot of people. But still, the game has had a ton of updates since it came out. And so we're going to be diving back on in today. And I kind of wanted to like run you through the basics of the game because I do have a lot of time in this game now. I've made it like really, really far with a couple of the classes. And like, so I know what I'm doing. I know like the structure of the game and I know where things are going. But anyways, Cultist Simulator. The goal of the game is that you are just a normal guy who by happenstance ends up finding out about occult powers or eldritch magic. And from there, you start this deep dive into the dream world and creating your own cult. And it will culminate with you assassinating public figures and detectives and things like that that are trying to catch you because obviously occult magic is illegal in this world and there's got to be some kind of challenge otherwise you would just roll through the game easily becoming the evil overlord uh, but in this case this is one of those games that's very very esoteric and weird uh, when you go to who is responsible right here the reason for that is Alexis Kennedy this guy right here is the writer for the first Sunless Sea if you ever played that game and you really, really liked the writing, this game was made by the lead writer for Sunless Sea and also Fallen London and a bunch of that other stuff. And so anyways, if you like that writing style where it's sort of intentionally obfuscated and confusing, then you will like this game too. Honestly, this game is playable completely and totally without knowing what's going on. You just kind of catch on to the mechanics and you'll start doing things. But I'm going to go ahead and purge my save. Oh, it hurts right now. I'm so far in that save. But, like, I really, really want to get you guys started with this game because this is one of those games that you can dump, like, 150 hours into, like, really, really easily. So let's start off. All right, so we're going with the Aspirant. The Aspirant was the first character ever released for this game back when it first came out. There are a number of other characters you can play as. You can play as the ghoul. You can play as the detective. You can play as the dancer. You can play... There's a whole bunch of them. They're all different. They all have, like, a different core consideration that you have to factor in as you're playing the game. But the Aspirant is the basic one that you will be playing first as you attempt to learn the game. And so, really, the entire game is divided up into two different types of cards. So you've got tiles and you've got cards. These tiles right here are verbs. So this one is work. Any card that you put inside of here will attempt to work using that value. So if you try to work using your passion, you'll make art. If you try to work using your health, you'll do backbreaking labor. If you try to work using your brains or your reason, you'll end up doing like accounting work or like lawyer's work or something else like that. We've also got to name our aspirant. Uh, we're going to name him Crafticult. And the really, really cool thing about this is our character right here, if we die, the game starts over. But all the other characters will reference this character like in their flavor text and stuff like that. So for example, uh, let's go ahead and put that in right there. Another shift mopping the darkened hallways, delivering post to hollow-eyed invalids and trundling corpse-laden gurneys to the basement. Off we go. And so this entire game is time-based. What you're going to see is that when we put that in there, it's going to take 10 seconds for that to conclude. And so we're taking a shift at the hospital right now in order to get started. Taking a shift at the hospital has given us two draw cards. Halfway through your shift, the head porter beckons you aside. We won't require your services any longer, he says. Here's your last payment. We've paid you through to the end of the month. I've lost my job, but at least now I have a little time to rest and my health has improved. So there you go. We've now been given health as a card. This is one of your fundamental statistics right here. So, the things that you want to pay attention to pretty much the entire game or else you die. If you're playing as the Aspirant, if you run out of money, you die. Uh, if you're playing as the Aspirant and you run out of health, you die. Uh, really, if any of these values right here, aside from in this little beginning portion of the game, hit zero, you die. Just keep that in mind that if you run out of any of them, like I think if you run out of passion, you become like a dull-eyed husk, basically. If you run out of reason, you just become a lunatic. If you run out of health, you obviously physically die. And if you run out of money, you end up homeless and you get sick that way. And then it absorbs your health and kills you. So anyways, let's take our health and we're going to go to work. We'll do some back-breaking, unskilled labor for meager pay. There we go. 60 seconds, that'll be done. We've also been gifted with another tile. 
the dream tile. The dream tile is going to basically be the way that you advance most of your cult goals as you're playing through the game. Uh, the dream tile does have a bunch of uses, and really the difficulty with this game is that, like, I don't want to spoil, because, like, the exploration is a huge part of this game, but at the same time, I'm kind of racking my brain, like, how can I teach you how to play the game without actually spoiling? And it's physically impossible, because the two things are kind of intrinsically linked. This is not one of those games where I can, like, tell you the mechanics and and not spoil the storyline. Sometimes in this game, figuring out the mechanic that you want to use is a big part of the storyline. And so, anyways, I'll get you like so. I'll give you like 30 minutes of runway here so that you can learn how to play this absolutely fantastic game. And hopefully, from there, you can take it yourself. Uh, we can recall our dreams. It began when I spoke to the old man in the hospital. He knew my name, but he's dead now. The pneumonia. Why do I dream of him still? What's the cobalt light in my dreams? So we've been given a contentment card. This is a temporary buff. You can use it for a number of things. Effectively, it means that we have an overwashing of ourselves of contentment. And it's also given us our next stat, passion. So now we have health and we have passion. The only one remaining that we haven't picked up yet is reason. Uh, this right here is your card tray. Your card tray can be moved around wherever you want it to go. Anything that gets dropped that is a buff or a temporary card will go in the card tray first. Uh, the card tray is kind of small. Sometimes I wish you could make it like a lot bigger, like basically cordon off like an entire section of the table to be used as it because honestly, once you get to a certain point in the game, you're going to be getting like eight to 10 cards at a time and this thing just overflows all over the place. And like, I don't think there's actually like a way to take it off the table and get rid of it. I don't know. I haven't tried. I've got like 40 hours in this game and I've never actually tried to get rid of the card tray. But yeah, there's the card tray. It's going to have all your buffs and all that kind of stuff in it. You can arrange the table however you want. This is pretty much the play space for the entire game. This is what the entire game looks like aside from certain parts. Uh, but anyways, you can arrange it however you want. I would suggest you make a little bit of room and do what you're going to do. So we'll kind of move these over here. One big complaint I do have about this game, I'm going to treat this a little bit like an impressions video, is occasionally the cards that you put down, or the cards, or the tiles that come from various events, they won't have like a place to go, and so they'll just smash in somewhere and get rid of all your organization. Drives me up a wall when that happens. I wish that it wouldn't, but it does. Uh, so our work, we're doing backbreaking labor for money right now. I'm actually going to put this... I don't know where I'm going to put my funds. We'll just keep them right there for right now. Uh, we've got passion. We can dream with our passion. I know this dream. A road crests a hilltop and the air is silver bright. Let's go for it. Uh, we don't have a lore that we can throw inside of there, unfortunately. So I doubt that our dream is going to culminate in anything. Uh, these cards right here, they're called lore cards. What the lore cards do is anything in this game, first and foremost, you can click and it'll give you a description of like what should go in here. And then also when you click on it, it'll make any cards that can go in there glow. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. Like it's pretty much the entire thing. So now we have to pay for our existence. So this guy right here is our rent timer. Every single time 60 seconds passes, we lose one of our funds, and then an event will happen. Uh, the events haven't started yet, but effectively this just shows like the passage of time. Like each one of these is like two weeks or like a month or whatever. It's like the 17, 1800s. It's like the 1800s in uh, London. This is your rent. Uh, we've completed our job. The day is done, and so am I, but I've earned my pay. There you go. We've got a little bit of money, and as you will notice, our health is now fatigued. That effectively means that it's just, like, tapped. Uh, after the 60 seconds, it'll come back, and we can use it again on whatever activity that we want to. In addition, we also got access to vitality. Every, si I mean, every single time you use one of your core stats, with exceptions, you will get an additive card that's kind of like an aspect of learning so like if I work with my health I'll get vitality out if I if I work with my mind I'll get erudition out and if I work with my passion I will get a glimmering out all three of those things are effectively XP towards making yourself stronger in this stat and getting another health card so if I have two vitalities I can get another health card so on and so forth, and it starts getting more and more difficult in order to get these things. They've also given us a new tile. This is the study tile. Uh, the study tile is super important. Pretty much every tile is super important, but the study tile, this is where the magic happens. This is where you're going to be studying esoteric texts. This is where you're going to be studying magic and increasing your spell schools. Uh, this is where you're going to be figuring out how to do rituals and all kinds of gnarly stuff. It's, it's, it's the place where the magic happens, quite literally, a lot of the time. Uh, we're dreaming pointlessly right now, which is kind of a bummer. I'm going to go ahead and fast forward until something happens. 
It looks like we've got a bequest. A letter from a solicitor, the old man at the hospital, and the one that I've been dreaming of has named me in his will. I will hear more soon. Let's see, I know this dream, the road crest. Oh, we still haven't slotted that in, gotcha. I'm not out of money, right? I was gonna say, I really hope I'm not out of money. Rumpled fields, the wink of a river, and a tingling chill. The crowds of sleep. Okay. So here we are. He's given us a lot of funds. He's also given us a package full of papers. So if we click on any of these, we can get more information about them and see this is the first time we can use the study thing right here. So this is a bequest. A package of peculiar papers from my correspondence executor. I must study it using passion or reason. We're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to go to work one more time. Hopefully this has 60 seconds left on it. And we're going to level up our health to level 2 so that we have two health cards. If you're not going to level up your stats, I highly, highly recommend... So, like, here's the thing. If you're going to ignore your stats, my minimum advice to you is don't ignore your health. Always make sure that you have maxed out health. You can ignore the other ones. You can get by with like three passion. You can get by with like four or three of your of your of your intelligence. You cannot get by with three health. Things are going to happen along the course of the game that are going to absorb those health cards. And if you don't have extra ones to replace them while you resolve whatever trauma or whatever contrition is causing that card to be held in limbo, then you're going to die because you're going to run out of health. So anyways, I dreamt of rain, whispering in the eaves and tapping on the windows like an old friend, hissing prankishly in the chimney. It's difficult to be unhappy in the right kind of rain. There you go. We got another contentment card. Uh, contentment can be used a couple of different ways. But I'm not going to spoil. Uh, contentment effectively allows you to run off bad feelings. And it can also help you in other ways at work. <laughs> I'll point you in the right direction, but I'll try not to spoil. Because figuring out the use for all these cards tends to be a big part of the game. And it's part of why the game is so fun. Is you kind of like rustling through all these different cards. Trying to figure out what they do and where they go. And how they can modify and affect other cards. Like it really is a big part of the game. And so even me telling you like simple stuff is going to kind of spoil the game. Alright, with these two vitalities, we can now level up our health. Which is a fantastically good idea. Uh, looks like right here. So what's going to happen is we have the events now. So as time passes, every single time this meter concludes, it's going to eat a fund. And then if you look at this little window right here, it's going to tell you the season that it is. Right now, it's the season of despair. That means if we have any dread on us, bad things are going to happen. And so it would behoove you in this situation to not have any dread cards on the table when that goes through. Uh, there you go. So the words contained knowledge, and now I contain it. It's a little like theft, and a little like feasting, and a little like the progress of an infectious disease. So there's erudition right there, which is to reason what vitality is to health. Uh, so we'll put that right there, and then we'll keep that right there. We have two vitalities, so we're going to go ahead and study these. And this is going to be us exercising. I'm a brim with vitality. If I devote some time to exercise, I will benefit. There you go. So in 60 seconds, we'll have two health cards. Bada bing! Bada boom. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can paint. Yeah, let's paint. I used to paint, and I could paint the sites that I half remember from my dreams. I might sell something, but I probably won't. There you go. If we have a yearning, it'll actually straight tell you right here what you need to put in that slot. It's a restlessness card. But we don't have restlessness yet. Restlessness comes around later. I'll let you know when I see it. In addition... I think I'll probably try to get my reason up to level 2. At the beginning of the game, it tends to be a really good idea. I, I would say you should level everything up to level 3 or so. That tends to make things a lot simpler. And, and you'll move a little bit faster if you have 3 reason, 3 health, and 3 passion before you kind of advance to the next part of the game. Now, we are painting right now, so we should get a glimmering from that because we're using our passion in order to do something creative. Our health is almost unfatigued right now. I'm going to dream with my reason, actually. There was once a man who said that the sleep of reason produces monsters. Often it is healthy to let the mind wander and sleep. But if I keep dreaming, sooner or later, some sort of monster will rise from my own fears. There we go. We got a health card, and then we also got the health card's associated skill card. Not only are we healthy now, we also are so healthy that we're skillful. So we have a stronger physique than an average person. So we've benefited from exercise. Now, what this card does is you can use any skill card inside your work tile to make the work go faster or add special modifiers to the work that make it more profitable. 
Uh, it looks like here, I found a customer. She'll probably hang it in her spare bedroom and never look at it again, but her money's good. Nice, sometimes paintings will get us, we got two glimmerings. That's a free level up for our passion. Oh, run! All right, so I'm gonna throw that in there. The Tigers of Wrath are wiser than the Horses of Instruction. If I spend time studying what I've learned, I can increase my passion and gain a skill. That's what we're doing right now. That's the plan. Uh, with our health, I would suggest that we go to, oh, dude, I should have slotted that in to show you how that works. Never mind, I've made a mistake. I've done a bad thing. Uh, this tile right here is temporary. This is the season of despair thing. So dark days, I need to be careful not to let doubts creep in. This little magnet right here means that if a card that fits inside of there is on the table, it will automatically get sucked in, and there's no way for you to stop it from happening. I mean, there are select, very limited ways to stop it from happening, but by and large, by the time this tile is on the table, you're toast. If you have like too many of those things. Right now we have no dread on the table, so it doesn't matter. This thing's just going to tick down, and because we passed the challenge without putting any any dread inside of there, uh, we'll end up getting a bonus. Even if we have dread inside of there, there's ways we can neutralize it and get this back to net zero. And once we get it back to net zero, we still get the reward, so don't worry about it too much. It's pretty simple. Let's see here. Once a oh, never mind. It didn't give us any new flavor text. So we've got a fleeting reminiscence. A fleeting reminiscence, useful for a lot of stuff. Uh, it's a counter to some bad things that can happen to you, and then it's also a benefit to some good things that you may be working on. Uh, there's another card right there. This is the Obsessions card. So it's the season of obsession right now. Uh, the obsession comes into play later. It's obsessions, temptations, and dedications, I think, are the things that that plays off of. But we don't have any of those things yet, so that's kind of a later game mechanic. So it's pretty much a freebie that we don't have to worry about. I dreamt of nothing at all. I woke and stretched and rose without haste. Those quiet hours have left me energized. Oh, nice. Cool. We got another vitality. And we'll get one out of work right there, too. You can push pause this game whenever you want with the space bar. I highly recommend that you do. Uh, the game can throw a lot at you. So I've got an M game playthrough on my computer in the living room right now where literally my entire table is covered with cards. And I know what each and every single one of them does. I know what each and every single one of them is working towards. Like, this is one of those games that, like, you will start out low functioning and it actually does a really good job of unrolling mechanics on you until like actually it's sort of impressive like when I first started this game it was really overwhelming and now after like 40 hours of playing it I can successfully manage like an entire table full of cards pretty easily and like know what's going on just through the usage of pause and active play there are more windows in my soul the sunlight is not the only thing that passes through the window I've gained passion but it'll be more difficult next time and we've been given a skill, the associated skill for passion, which is a vivid imagination. Oh, yes. Let's go ahead and study health over here. Long walks will kill the cobwebs. We're going to try. I've got an extra vitality just laying around. Oh, dude, there's our restlessness right there. Uh, that's what we needed for our passion. So I'll go ahead and try to put that into play. Uh, one of the fundamental ways you get rid of restlessness is by painting or doing something creative. If you don't do something with restlessness, it will turn into dread when that finishes ticking down. And dread is a bad thing. You don't want dread. Dread makes your life difficult. Dread makes your life unhappy. So, if we put our skill inside of our work tile right here, you now see that there's two things that we can add to our paintings called art or bread. Uh, what you can do with these is you can either put passion inside of here, or you can put other life experiences inside of here to influence your painting in different directions. These little things down here at the bottom, I can explain to you what they do, but they don't really make sense until way later in the game. Like, you really gotta have like 10, 15 hours under your belt before all this stuff down here is relevant. Really, this is how much aspect goes into what you're doing right now. In general, higher is better. Uh, so this has like the aspect of moth, which is one of the magical disciplines in this game. Uh, anything over 10 moth is going to give you like an, a crazy awesome painting that's worth a bunch of money. Uh, aspect ability, that's just kind of letting you know that we're using our skill right here in order to do that thing. This right here, imagination, is letting you know that we're using that skill. And then this right here means that we've added ingredients to it, namely these passion cards. You can see that the values down here at the bottom are going to be added from whatever you've put in. But like I said, it's not going to matter now. It'll matter way later on into the game. And then now we have restlessness. So we can go ahead and throw that on in there to make our painting even better. Our painting even more awesomer. All right. We don't really have a whole lot going on right now. 
We're studying our health. These vitalities are going to go in there so that we can make some kind of passive strides to level up our strength and get stronger. And then we also need to process that request right there. Otherwise, we're going to have problems. However, like, the game basically starts once you study this. And so what I like to do, just as a tip to new players, is I like to level up all my stats to three or four before I process this bequest right here and I actually start making my own cult. The reason why is this tile right here. This is the hunter's tile. The hunter's tile are the people in law enforcement who are hunting you. They are aware that there are evil sorcerers, magicians, and cultists in the city, and they are trying to find you. The second we start down this path of the shadows, these guys will start having evidence that they can find that will be leaving like a little breadcrumb trail. And we don't want that right now while we're weak and stupid and passionless. <laughs> so like, we kind of want to work on it. I'm safe for now. Their attention must be elsewhere. It won't be. Not for long. All right. So there we go. We've got a health and a vitality. I would suggest we throw both of those into there. This time it's not going to give us a new health, but it is going to combine these into like a super vitality. And then with two super vitalities, we can get our third health, uh, which we need one more vitality in order to complete that. Our painting is done. My recent work has drawn some attention. Something should sell. There you go. So we've got funds in there. So we've got our passion right there. We've got our funds. We've got mystique. That's not great. Uh, mystique is basically... When you create Mystique, Mystique is not damning evidence about your character. Mystique is just like obfuscation, suspicion. Like it means this is basically your shadiness level, but it's not shadiness that anybody can prove. It's just people get a weird vibe from you. Like they feel like you're up to something. And when hunters, when it's the season of the hunter, they'll they'll take this and they'll keep investigating it for long amounts of time instead of like leaving quickly if there was none of it. Uh, we've got two glimmerings over here, which is pretty cool. Pretty excited about that. Our vivid imagination is back along with our passion. So we'll go ahead and throw that over there. I'm going to throw the funds inside of that pile just to stack it all up. There's also a useful button right here you can click that stacks all cards of a similar type. Uh, if they've got a timer on them, they can't be stacked, and so it's going to get cluttered. You just got to accept that it's going to get cluttered out here. I'm going to use my physical skill right here. We'll go like so. It's the season of fascination, so we should be okay. If it was the season of illness, uh, this health would get absorbed, and we'd have kind of problems right now. Our fleeting reminiscence is about to go. I'm going to go ahead and speed the game up for just a second since we don't have a whole lot going on. I could be dreaming right now, but like, dreams sometimes have consequences, and I don't feel like dealing with consequences while I'm trying to get all of my studies and whatnot put together. So there's our first super vitality. And then our physique is back. Let's go ahead and make another super vitality. And then once we have two super vitalities, we can combine it with our stronger physique skill, and we will become even mightier and even more buff. Bruh. Uh, we will also go with a... Viv Actually, we'll swap one of these out for Mystique. There we go. Uh, we don't have an inspiration right now. I'm pretty much only doing that so that I can get free, uh, free glimmerings so that maybe I can take my passion up to level 3. I find that health and passion are very easy to level up. It's the stuff that gets you into trouble. Uh, reason is the one that's really hard to level up. Reason's not that bad until like level 4, but going from level 4 to level 5, you gotta kind of have metagame knowledge, otherwise it's not gonna work. Like you got, There's not a lot of ways to get erudition efficiently. I mean, you can get a character who will lock in your erudition and make it so that it doesn't decay like these glimmerings are, but that's kind of a conversation for a different time. I think we're going to get this within two seconds of these glimmerings going out. we got another fleeting reminiscence right there. I don't know if our painting is going to go good. I didn't put an inspiration in there either. I should have put the vitality in there as an inspiration. Give us a few more points. Oh, it's the season of illness. That's not good. Okay, uh, we got an extra vitality, so it'll be fine. We'll be okay. Uh, what this does is we're just sick right now. We've become unwell. So this health card is going to get converted into an illness card, and then I'll show you how you resolve that pretty soon. Uh, we've got a lesson learnt right here. So now what we want to do is we want to put that right there, and then with both of our super vitalities, and we will grow even stronger. Okay, so our painting is done. Uh, we're bodybuilding while painting right now because, like Ben Franklin, we're a renaissance man. A lot of this game, so like, I know a lot of people are not going to be into this game just because of the way that it's presented, but I promise you, this is a really good game. 
Like, it's so rare that unique things come out in, in the world. And this game is truly unique. It does have its flaws, which I'll talk about near the end of the video, just in case any of those flaws are the kind of thing that tilt you as a player. Because they are very specific flaws. We got more Mystique. Goody. Alright, I'll take my passion back and my skill, I guess. And that's left us in a decent spot, actually. I think we'll be okay. Now we've got contentment, just in case we've got to deal with uh, any type of any any type of restlessness or whatever. We're leveling up. We're getting stronger. To show you the cult portions of the game, I'll probably process the bequest next, just so we can move forward and you can see some of the cult gameplay for a little bit. Maybe I'll cut the video a tiny bit longer so that you can fully like absorb that and appreciate it. I mean, it's not. I don't know if 5 or 10 minutes is going to make a distant difference. This is a very long-winded game. Like, right now, I have a game that's, like, 20 hours long. Like, the game that I was telling you about where my entire board is just, like, cards all over the place. Uh, that's a... I've been playing for 20 hours uh, on that one. So, this is a very, very long-winded game. So, you see how that tile lights up when I pick this up? The game will give you hints on how to resolve certain things. It didn't used to do that, but now that it does, I think it makes the game a lot better. Uh, the game was too confusing back when it first came out. Now it gives you like these hints that are just the right amount of help. Uh, we'll go ahead, you put a vitality with an affliction and it'll get rid of it. And it'll convert it back to health. We're good on money right now, which is surprising. Normally in the beginning of the game, I have like no money whatsoever and I'm always broke and struggling. I should probably get back to work though. Let's wait a second. Let's wait till our strength comes back out. I could wait for this passion to not be exhausted too, and we could do another painting. But we don't really have anything to paint with right now, unfortunately. Yeah, we do actually. I gotta save these glimmerings. I'm gonna save these glimmerings down here. They're about to... They are about to disappear. Yep, let me get those back right there. We've got that. So we've got a hardened physique now, and if we click on it, we're as strong as a blacksmith or a soldier. That's actually pretty strong. Like, blacksmiths back in the day were pretty yoked out. Uh, with these glimmerings, we need to throw those in there to make them into a super glimmering. Uh, so that we can start leveling up our art skill. Our inspiration will be a fleeting reminiscence right there. It says that it's a mood piece and it should have an impact. And so by the combination of the stuff we have down here, we have over five moth aspect. Anything over five usually means you got a decent chance of making some money. Anything over ten means that it's going to be a pretty mind-blowing piece of art. And if you can get up to 15 or 20, that's when you really start to get the cool stuff that allow you to sell at art galleries and auction and things of that nature. Uh, we can buy paints right here. Buy Buying paints doesn't do anything, as far as I can tell, aside from give you more glimmerings. My best guess as to what the paints do, they don't make you earn more money, but they do seem to increase the amount of XP you get from painting. So, just my thoughts on that mechanic. We've got another fleeting reminiscence right there. Our super glimmering is almost out. Trists and interludes. We don't have a lover, so that's not going to come into play just yet. But like... The game is not showing you its full potential right now. So let me tell you about some of the stuff that I did in my 20-hour playthrough. I made a cult that was dedicated to assassination and murder. While doing that, we also had all kinds of crazy man orgies. Uh, one of my lovers decided to betray me because they found out about my other lovers. He started a rival cult, but he was associated with my cult. He started assassinating police officers and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, but because he was still associated with me, that drew all the heat down on my cult instead of his unknown cult. I chased him all over the world until I successfully blew him up with a bomb. However, the explosion of killing him coincided with an investigation that was going on into my cult. And so, like, it became, like, this giant situation of me defending myself, for, like, from evidence in court and everything else. Like, it was wild. I had to petition high society to countermine the police. Like, it got wild. It just, this game's a slow roller. That's all that, it, it's a slow roller. It starts off slow, but trust me, it gets really, really interesting if you've got some imagination. Uh, we'll go ahead and put that over there. We've got two more glimmerings right here. So I'll make the super glimmerings. And then we'll level up our passion to level three. Okay, we are ready for skill level three. And so what this will do is it'll actually make our a wild imagination. And then from there we'll be able to put in three cards when we make our paintings to increase the aspects even more and make our paintings even more interesting and valuable to the public eye. In addition, we can dream on passion right now. Uh, we don't have a lore to play around with. Oh, look! Anytime that happens, 
it means that you're moving towards a goal. It may not be a positive goal. Just a fair warning, it may not be a good goal. It may not be a goal that works out for you. But towards one of the game's end states, whenever that happens to the table, it means that you've made a step in the right direction to advance the story in some way, positive or negative. Alright, so we got a little bit of vitality sitting around right there. I'm gonna wait for this stuff to get done. Oh no! They found our mystique. That's what I was worried about. All right, well, if they're going to find my mystique anyways, look at that. we got a wild imagination now. If they're going to find my mystique anyways, let's just go ahead and start making a cult. Uh, I'm going to process this with passion, I guess. I read, theorize, pace, sketch, clutch at my hair and wonder and rise in elation before I collapse in despair. I love the prose in this game. The writer is such a talented writer. Like, I've never seen anybody... Oh look, there's our adversary. So because he found Mystique, they've actually assigned someone to our case. Uh, so there's somebody monitoring us. This gentleman would much rather be left alone with his pipe in an illustrated London news, but no. Apparently some conjurer of abominations has to be hunted down like a mad dog. And apparently nobody else can find the time. He's also passive aggressive. Okay, so all of our states are done. Uh, in dreaming, we got a fascination. That's actually not super great. I don't have a way. Actually, I do have a way to deal with fascination right now. Never mind. Fascination is kind of a late game mechanic. So fascination means that you're like full on tripping balls, like out in the woods, like looking into the situation right now. Like you're you're no longer you're in your right mind, but you are transfixed with the occult effectively, and you will be transfixed for another three minutes. A uh, bad stuff happens if you have too much fascination. However, fascination can be used in a positive way. So, for example, I could use fascination to inspire a painting. I could use fascination in order to study magic more aggressively. Lots of stuff you can do. Uh, my correspondent has described my dreams exactly. They use names that instantly are familiar. The house, the wood, the hours, the glory. I sense here a power that generals and kings would envy. A new desire burns inside of me. There is a note here, directions to a bookshop that does not advertise its wares. I'm not going to flip these cards because we're on the season of obsession right now. No! It pulled it out anyways. I thought that if I didn't flip the card, it wouldn't take it. I mean, anyways, we got our passion back, so that's cool. Uh, we got directions to Moreland's, notes on a possible collaborator, and the Smith's secret. So this is our first magical school right here. These cards are very, very important. And actually, they are the crux of the only thing that I think is wrong with this game. Uh, so these right here, you see how there's a circle right there? That circle fills up as you level this up and you become more powerful in that particular school. So this right here is the magic of the smith. Uh, the, smagi the magic of the smith is the magic of making and unmaking. It's the magic of the forge, effectively and it will level up, and this little track will go up on the inside as it levels up. The problem is, leveling these things up is a massive grindy headache, and pretty much the only part of the game that I don't like. Uh, doing it is completely based on randomness and whether or not you have the resource available. Even knowing metagame what four or five resources may come up, you can prep like half of them, but they'll be getting sucked into the cards that come from like the season of desires or the season of fascination or the season of whatever ruining your plans. It's just a frustrating mechanic and it's really grindy and it can be really frustrating from time to time. They have made it easier, but even after making it easier, honestly, it's still just a hugely grindy system that I think the game could do without. Uh, this is the one flaw in the game, is leveling up your magic, in my opinion. I think leveling up your magic should just be as easy as having two of the same type or two of the corresponding opposites and putting them in here, and then they automatically level up and make the game flow a lot smoother. And honestly, like, the game has a lot of padding. In my 20-hour playthrough, there's no real reason for it to have taken 20 hours. The reason it's taken that long is leveling up all my magic schools. Um, I'd probably be done with the game in about 10 hours if I didn't have to do it that way. Uh, so anyways... Let's see here. So it sucked in my temptation right there. Something bad is going to happen when that comes out, but I don't remember what. I think restlessness, maybe? Yeah, restlessness. Okay, I can deal with that. That's fine. Uh, we'll take our... We'll take our brand new art skill for a spin. I'll throw an inspiration on in there. What's this right here? We've got a season of rest. Okay, so nothing's going to happen when this one gets done. Hopefully, we'll make a little money off this, though. That'll be cool. I'm not going to buy any paints. Oh, yeah. Let's go ahead and get... The directions to Moreland's right here. The directions to Moreland's shop are cryptic. When one deals with the kind of books my correspondent studied, one must be circumspect. 
Yeah, let's go ahead and throw that on in there real fast. I'll slow the game down a little bit, too. Uh, we do have an Essence of Magic right now. Were we to dream with our passion on that Essence of Magic, I believe we could begin the path to starting our cult. I think that's the first step. Uh, but it really depends. What do you want to dedicate your cult to? There's about seven of these. As far as I remember, there's the Smith, there's the Moth, there's the Edge, there's the Lantern, there's the Heart, there's the Chalice, and there's the Winter and the occult, I think, are all the different magical schools. And they all worship different things. So these guys will be craftsmen. Like, they want to make evil magical objects that subvert and kind of corrupt goodness or in order, as in order to bring on the Eldritch Gods. Uh, chalice is like the pursuit of sensation and debauchery. Uh, heart is the pursuit of, like, charisma and, like, brainwashing and, and sort of convincing people to join in on you and sort of corrupting them, I guess. Uh, if you have Edge, that's basically murder, like you're a cult based around murder. Uh, if it's Winter, it's a cult around silence and a cult around something else. But anyways, it does matter. So whichever one of these lores that we select, it will become the core tenet that our cult worships and is working towards in, in their goals. And it does matter. So, like, the Smiths will do different stuff than the Assassins will, and the Assassins will do different stuff than the Chalice guys will. We only made a buck right there. I was hoping we'd make a little bit more money, but we had to get rid of the restlessness anyways. So it's not really that big of a deal. Like, we kind of had to do it either way. Uh, leveling up reason's going to be kind Hey, we got the explorer tile. All right. So this explorer tile right here does exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's for locations. You put a location in there, and you will explore it. Uh, there's also other interesting things you can do with it. So, for example, we could put... Oh, we can't do that yet. Never mind. Uh, we could put a health in there, and that means that we go walking around the city just hoping to stumble across something interesting. An ill-lit street is an ill-favored bend in a lesser river. A soft yellow light through a grimy window. Miss Moreland nods as I enter, but doesn't rise. I never ask the names of my clients, she informs me, before I have time to introduce myself. So there you go. We now have our first location. So I'll go ahead and put that like right there with our explorer verb. Now that I've found a location, I can explore it. There we go. There's another one of our magical disciplines, an occult scrap. So this is a little bit different from these. Like this right here is like general purpose occult knowledge that is unaspected. So like this doesn't work you towards any particular god, any particular eldritch power. It, it's just kind of esoteric knowledge. It just means that you know some random occult fact or tidbit that you can apply in some way when working on one of your other things. So this guy right here is more of a resource than anything else. Uh, but we can take this occult scrap and we can put it in right here. We can study it. There's a couple of different things you can do with it. I think if we study it, it's so that we can combine it with other stuff to make it stronger. Uh, if we explore it, it will give us access to either a person or a location. But we may also kind of get ourselves into trouble in that process, so keep that in mind. Uh, it's the season of notoriety up next, so our fascination shouldn't really matter. That should be gone pretty soon, I think. Let's go ahead and I'm going to study reason so that we can get smarter. I'm going to go to Moreland's shop, and we are going to buy a book. I'm going to work with my physique to earn some money. And I think that should be about it for now. So anyways, I keep referring to my, my 20 plus hour game that I've been working on for the last three or four days, and I figured I'd give you a show of it to show you that, like, I'm not lying. This is what the end of the game looks like right here. Like, I'm probably 80% of the way through the campaign right now, and I'm on my way to a win if I can avoid it. So let me just take a couple minutes and I'll walk you through what all this is. These are those magics that I was talking about. You see that track? They level up. So right now, I'm level 10 in Heart, Lantern, Edge, Moth, Key. And then it looks like I'm level 8 in Chalice. And it looks like I'm slightly lower level in the other few magics that exist. I've got my relics over here. These are all the evil objects that I've pulled from the world. So I've got a Bone Flute, the Germiniad, which is a book, a Cinnabar Amulet... Bled's Blade, Wildering Mirrors, this thing was crazy useful. I actually had to have this, otherwise, like, I couldn't beat a challenge. I happened to have it when it asked for it, and it helped me, like, massively increase my occult knowledge. 
Uh, I've got the icon of St. Agnes and winged dolls. As of right now, these are all the locations that I can explore. So at a certain point, you can send out all your cult members, which are all these guys right here. So these are all the members of my cult that I've picked up. Uh, you can send them on parties, D&D &D style, to go on quests and locations to bring back relics and books and things of that nature. Sometimes other more interesting stuff. Eh, we've got other places that I can explore. Like this right here is like a whorehouse, basically. Uh, or a brothel. Uh, we, I'm a scholar of Sanskrit, Aramaic, Fusine, Latin, Greek. Um, I've dreamed about the wood, the white door, the peacock's door, the spider door. Uh, these are all things that you need to be successful at, otherwise you will never advance your knowledge. Like, this is basically you working your way through the realm of the gods, and each one of these is basically a badge that's like, yeah, you made it. I'm a profound scholar with a flawless physique. Um, I'm basically a super brilliant artist at this point. I've got an auction house. I've got a permanent scar right here that I picked up during a battle with a particular curse that I got inside one of these locations. Uh, that's the bookshop that we unlocked, which I've bought all the books, so it's closed now. And over here, you've got all my mystique and my glimmerings and whatnot. Uh, I'm notorious right now, so I committed a crime. If the police find this, they'll process it into evidence. Uh, over here are all the various badass rites that I have for summoning eldritch monsters. Uh, so I can summon everything from, like, for example, I summoned a, an assassin that lives inside of mirrors and dies instantly if looked at, but can spawn out of any mirror and stab you in the back, basically, and kill you. And I used it to assassinate a member of the police force. These are all of the various pigments that I can use for paintings and, and things of that nature to make really, really cool stuff. So anyways, as you can see, there's a lot more to the game than, than one might think. Like, it, it honestly, it gets kind of overwhelming unless you're paying attention the whole time. If you're paying attention the whole time, like, I know precisely what each and every one of these cards does, and I'm working towards using it. But, you know, uh, when you've got, trust me, like five hours ago, ten hours ago in my playthrough, my board looked exactly the same, and I had no idea what any of the stuff did. And so it's just been me slowly, like, fiddling with things and figuring it out. And making like these big sprints of advancement while being stuck for an hour or so. Uh, but now I know exactly what I'm working towards, and I think I'm on the home stretch to winning. But this is what the game starts to look like. You know what I mean? This is what it gets to once you're about 80, 75% of the way through the campaign. Um, uh, but anyways, we're getting closer towards creating our own cult. I hope you guys enjoyed this little primer into Cult Simulator and, like, what it is. Uh, this game is very much a game based on, like, reading the excerpts and using your imagination to sort of visualize what's happening in your head. It's also a game about exploration. It's a game about discovery. It's a game about, like, solving mysteries, even though you're not quite sure what's going on. It's incredible how frequently you can solve a puzzle in this game even though you have no idea what the puzzle is or how the pieces work. The game just kind of naturally works tactilely if you're experimenting and playing around with things. And then in retrospect, it'll make a lot of sense later on when you get some more information. And this is a game that you're meant to play and lose and die. And each time you learn a few more metagame things that help you the next time you play the game with the interactions and how to do this and how to do that, uh, the game is actually doesn't have that many gotchas for new players. Like, you will occasionally stub your toe on something or get lost, uh, that's okay, you're supposed to. Be feeling lost is like a big part of this game. It's a part of what makes the whole thing so interesting. Like, it's what makes you... It's what makes you empathize with your character. Your character is a normal guy who's diving into this occult world of ancient gods and, you know, speaking Phrygian and Aramaic and stuff like that. And he's just a normal guy that used to push gurneys at a hospital. Like, you're not particularly educated. You're not particularly talented. Like, it would be confusing if you were just a normal, like, 5 out of 10 layman getting into this entire occult world. And you developing your skills and getting smarter and getting stronger and getting more passionate is a part of the journey. And you will understand more as your stats increase, you know. And as you play the game more, you'll start to see the interactions and why it matters. Uh, so anyways, I can't recommend this game highly enough. I really like it. I like it to the extent that I'm able to ignore the grindier aspects of the game simply on my enjoyment. And the game still continues to get content to this day. They just got a new DLC with a brand new character that's like another 20-hour campaign that you can play. As of right now, there's like five or six characters. You get the main one, you get the detective, and I think you get like a socialite or something like that in the base game. And then after that, you buy the other ones. There's like the ghoul, there's there's, there, there's the, the dancer, there's a couple of different ones. But anyways, I, I really, really like this game, and I can't recommend it highly enough. I've poured 
loads of hours into this game the last couple weeks after mostly ignoring it since it came out and honestly it's had me utterly transfixed if you enjoyed this video make sure you go to the discord and loop up with the community make sure you check out the twitch stream where i'll be live most days of the week i will see you all later thank you for stopping on in leave a like on the video if you